Good evening and welcome to tonight's episode of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamantunga Kumalo. This is episode 14 and we are currently on day 34 of the national lockdown. Now, today we'll actually be covering something that a lot of people are very likely not aware of when they're buying their properties. And we'll be looking at the five hidden costs to home ownership. Now, a lot of us know of some of the costs that might be involved when we're buying our home. And just last week, we were talking about some of the costs in selling your property. But not not many of us are aware of some of the costs when you already have your property and you essentially need to keep with the day-to-day -day running of your particular property. And joining me this evening to help us understand some of the costs in home ownership is Marius van Rensburg, who is a partner at Schindler's, um, who's going to help us. And we'll also talk about some of the costs as you buy your property. Uh, good evening, Marius, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Now, maybe perhaps before we even start with some of the, the hidden costs, um, as I mentioned, I mean, there are probably three big costs um, when you buy your property. And of course, uh, maybe let's help our viewers at home understand some of those costs. Uh, I think something that's probably right up your alley, of course, are the attorney costs that give a lot of us quite a lot of headache. If you can just take us through the two, um, I'll say attorney costs associated when you buy a property that's a bonded property. Yeah, so I mean, you know, if, if you, if you, if you, you know, there, there are essentially two sets of costs. The, the, fir the first set of costs is your, is your transfer costs and the second set of costs are your bond registration costs. So if you buy the property, the, you, you, uh, the conveyancer gets appointed generally by the seller and that conveyancing attorney is the transferring attorney and that attorney will, will, will charge, uh, um, will send you an account for transfer costs. And those, the, those costs are different to the bond costs. So if, you, if you're taking out a mortgage bond, the bank is going to appoint a bond registration attorney and that bond attorney is going to um, you know, raise a bond cost, which is separate from the transfer costs. And I, and I think it's important to, to, to realize because there are a lot of buyers who, who we, 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 you know, they, they get the second account from the bond attorney and they, they didn't realize that that account was coming, so they haven't planned for it. Um, and, and it does create a problem. And um, you know, a, a good agent will, will, will explain to you what your bond costs are and what your transfer costs are. And you know, what we advocate at Schindler's is that, um, you know, get the agents to give us a call, give us a call, get a pro forma account and actually look and see what those exact costs are before you buy the property. I mean, most conveyances will happily give you the costs. And then also remember on your transfer costs, it's, um, you know, people get terminology confused. They try that, that you talk about transfer costs encompasses a number of things. One is the conveyancing fee. And the other one is the transfer duty. And then there's a bunch of dis disbursements like deeds office charges, and that kind of stuff. So um, it would be nice if, if the conveyances took the entire transfer costs. We don't. We only take a, a conveyancing fee. And that conveyancing fee is based on a, a tariff that's issued by the law society every year. And then, of course, the transfer duty is what you pay to the government. In, um, in, in, it's, a, it's a property tax that you pay when you buy the property. And that's based on the Australian scales. So, yeah, I think it's massively important to know exactly what those costs are up front because, you know, the higher the, higher the purchase price of the property, the more expensive it gets. And, you know, one of the things that you're mentioning is that uh, when you're buying your property, you might know of the transferring attorneys, but you hadn't actually budgeted for the bond registration attorneys. And when I shared in one of the episodes with our listeners at home that I was in the exact same predicament. Um, I mean, when I bought my first property, I actually bought two properties at the same time. So in my budgeting, I'd only budgeted essentially for two attorneys, not knowing that I actually had to budget for four because there were... Uh, two bond registration attorneys that we're also going to that I was also going to be dealing with, and it's such a substantial cost when you are not aware of it um, that it could potentially derail the purchase of a particular property that you're um, that you're interested in. But staying with the the transferring attorneys and perhaps even the bond registration attorneys, are these amounts negotiable? Because I mean, I, I sometimes hear people say, you know, yes, they send the pro forma in, um, invoice, but it's you can have a conversation with them around. Uh, potentially getting um, a decrease on them. How likely is it really that we can get um, a decrease when having a conversation with the attorneys? <laughs> it's the it's a it's it's a potentially unpleasant conversation for us to have. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Uh, like, like, 
like, like anybody who does a job, you know, you'd like to get paid your full fee. Um, but, you know, there, there is a reality and, um, you know, there, there, there are pushes and pulls within our own markets. And, yeah, I mean, if, if you ask for a discount and you justify it, it's, it's, it's possible that, that you can get a discount. Um, you know, generally speaking, you know, I mean, to give an example, if I receive a transfer and I also receive the bond, it, it makes it easier for me to discount the bond fee. And, and, and in some instances, you know, um, the banks want you to discount the bond fee if you're doing the bond and the transfer together, but that depends on, on, the, on, on, on whether that can happen or not and whether the transfer return is on the bond panel. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, the, the other basis on, on which I think is a good basis to, to, to discount a fee is, is if, if I get two transfers. So for example, if you are selling a property and you're buying a property, then you say to me, Marius, you know, if Schindler's does both tra both transfers, I'm bringing you double business. Can you give me a discount? And then, yeah, we 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 can work out a discount. And we also we also try to take a practical approach to these things. There are certain people, like first-time home buyers, who we want to help, um, and we'll we'll discuss a, a, an account. So, you know, I always say, um, if you don't ask, you won't get. So it's it's worth asking. I mean, I I remember when I bought. I wasn't aware that you could even ask for uh, a discount. It was only in later properties that I learned that that pro forma invoice is not set in stone. So you can actually um, ask for a discount. And of course, if you've got any questions at home um, around some of the costs associated with home ownership, you're more than welcome to send them through uh, for Maris and myself to discuss. And Maris, now let's look at perhaps um, another substantive, well, depending on how you look at it, potentially big cost that goes with um, ho owning uh, a home, which is of course the homeowner's and the life insurance. I mean, we spoke a little bit about it offline, um, but I mean, I was saying that I know with some banks, they may sometimes require you to have um, to insurance on your bond or even a life cover on your bond. If you could just you know, speak to us about those, those two types of um, insurances and the, potentially the reasons why banks uh, might in certain instances require us to have them. Yeah. Well, let's, I think let's, let's very clearly distinguish, first of all, between the two kinds of insurance, because they are very distinct and different insurances. You know, the, 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 first, car, the first insurance is, is, your, is, your, um, is, your, is your homeowner's insurance over the property itself. So, and it's really important, you know, if, if, you're buying, if you're buying a property, so, so let me say this again, and let's drill down to two different scenarios. One is you're buying in a sexual title scheme, and if you buy a sectional title scheme, your, your, insu your, your insurance over the sectional title unit that you're buying um, is included in the levies that you pay monthly to the body corporate. So what happens is that the body corporate insures the entire sectional title scheme and your levies that are included, you don't need to go and take an additional insurance. If you're buying a freehold property or a property within a cluster development, well, then it's, it's slightly different. And then, then you need to take your own insurance. Now, if you take out a mortgage bond, the bank is going to want you to take out, want proof of, of, of the insurance that you're taking. So, you know, whichever bank you go to, um, they, they'll, they, they'll, you know, they, they can't make you take their insurance. So they, they, that particular bank has an insurance company that they, that they deal with. They can't make you take the insurance and they don't, but they give you the option. So you can go and take out whatever insurance you want. But the, if you're taking a bond, um, the bank is going to want to know that there is insurance over the property. And the reason for that is, if the worst happens and the property burns down, then the, then the bank can pay, the, the property gets rebuilt and the, and the bank's security is, is there again. So that's, you know, that's, that's the actual homeowner's insurance. And of course, if you're not taking a bond and you're buying free property, well, you know, please, please be sure to go and take out your own private insurance because it's, it's, it's important. You know, if, if you're not taking a bond, there's, there's no bank just to make it obligatory to take insurance. But of course, I, I think it's a good idea, you know, that's, and that's my personal opinion, take out the insurance, have it there. So that, that's your first kind of insurance, which is your, your insurance over the property itself. The, the second kind of insurance that comes into play is, is, the, is the life insurance. So that means if you die, you're in a car accident, the life insurance policy pays out and, and potentially settles your bond. So, you know, a lot of banks, don't, you know, they don't make it, it depends on the instruction, it just depends on you and the client, it depends on what you're buying. Banks may make it a condition of the bond that you take out life insurance. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, you, you can sometimes go with their own in-house life insurance, but you have the choice of getting your own life insurance. 
um, you know, we were talking, uh, talking about this offline. Um, I think, you know, I personally think insurance is, 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 a, is a good thing to have. But, you know, if you want to avoid the expense, it depends on, on what phase of life you're in. You know, if you are 25 or 28 years old and you're buying your first property and there's a bit of equity in the property and you don't necessarily have a family to look after or a spouse, you know, maybe you, you, you can forego the luxury of having the insurance. If you are um, maybe a bit older, you know, you have to be, but if you're, let's say, 35, 40 years old, you have a spouse and children you need to support, you know, it, 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 you know, and for me personally, I have life insurance over all my properties and all the bonds. Um, and it gives me a great amount of comfort to know that if I'm hit by a bus and I die, um, once I can get out of lockdown, of course that is, um, <laughs> and then at least my, uh, my, my life insurance will, will pay out. And, and the comfort that that gives me is that while my state is being wound up, my bond gets paid off. There's no pressure on my family. They can remain in the house. Um, we don't need to, to sell the house to, 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 to pay debts. We don't need to worry about the bond installments. It's paid and it's settled and, and that gives me a lot of comfort. So I, I personally think it's, a, it's, it's not a bad thing to consider. I think, uh, you know, one of the things when it comes, when I, whenever I think about insurance and particularly life insurance, uh, and, and we're seeing our earlier conversation is around, I mean, so I'm unmarried, no children, got multiple properties. And sometimes there's a part of me that thinks, oh, perhaps there's no need to necessarily have life insurance. But then you think about the, the admin of, you know, God forbid I die, sort of touches wood, and, and my estate is being round up. And how that's going to potentially affect um, you know, my family. So in as much as I may not be married or have children, there's still essentially admin that goes with my particular estate. So you also want to ensure that you, you, the loved ones that you've left behind don't have to deal with um, the anxiety of having to find out about different bonds or properties and you know whether I had equity in them and those kind of things. And if anything, I think for us, certainly as a private property podcast, it raises the question of um, us having a conversation around estate planning when we've got a portfolio and different ways we can navigate it. I mean, I know uh, there's been quite a keen interest from our viewers at home to even look at the different ways of ownership. Um, so are we going to be buying uh, respective properties in our personal names or in our companies and understanding what the implications of it being owned by, you know, in our personal uh, capacity or it's owned by another legal entity and how that potentially has an impact on how your estate um, gets wound up uh, in the event of your untimely Death. Now, Marius, we do have questions coming in from, from listeners and viewers at home, and one of them is coming in from uh, Southiel Ntombene, who asks, who appoints um, the attorneys? Do I have the option to use my own attorney? So let me, and that's let me a pretty agree. contentious one. Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I must be honest, I don't see it as contentious. I think that um, the, the, it's, it's a case of often acceptance. The, the, yeah. the, the, the way it works here, I know it's certainly in Johannesburg, is that it's, it's the seller's right to nominate the conveyancing attorney. Um, once, the, once, the sellers, once the conveyancing attorney has been nominated, it must be understood that the, 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 the conveyancer then acts on the instruction of the seller. But you know, conveyances, um, we're not litigating, we're not fighting with each other. We, 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 we're going towards a positive end and we have a legal duty to, to observe the interests of both parties in that process. And I know I have colleagues overseas who, who, who think this idea of having one conveyance for both parties is, is absolutely terrible. Um, but you know, in, in, in my view, it, it, it really does actually to, to work out. That's not to say that, that a buyer can't make an offer to purchase on the basis that they make it a condition of the sale that they utilize the services of their own conveyancer. You can do that. And, um, and if the seller agrees, well, then you, 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 know, you can utilize the services of, of your own conveyancer. In regard to, to the appointment of the attorney for, for a mortgage bond, well, you know, that's, that, that depends on the banks. The, 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 the various banks have different policies. There are certain banks who, as an absolute matter of policy, will never allow the transferring attorney and the bond attorney to be the same. There's other banks that, uh, that will allow the bond and transfer attorney to be the same. Um, and there's other banks, depending on, on what panel you're on with the banks, you know, you, you can do it. But bearing in mind that in order to do the bond, you have to be on the bank's panel. And there's, so each bank has a panel of attorneys. 
and um, the, the bank can only appoint attorneys or will only appoint attorneys on their panel. But the bank generally reserves the right in the final analysis to, to appoint that attorney, but you may well influence it here and there. And, um, you know, Maris, another uh, question coming in, this one is from Holiness Cindy Wehlela, who asks, um, you know, the question is around, I'm interested to know if um, you're planning to buy a property cash, you know, what are the, the implications in terms of attorneys? Because, I mean, we've been speaking a lot about bonded properties, so they essentially want to know if you're buying in cash, so you're not going to the bank, then as far as attorneys are concerned, which ones would you essentially be paying for? Yeah, if, if, you, if you're paying cash for the property, then you don't need a bond. Uh, you don't need a bond attorney, and then you just have a transferring attorney. So, you, you know, the, and, yeah, it's, it's, it's as simple as that. If you pay cash, there's only a transferring attorney. And, and what you would then do is, is you have an agreement to sell. Your agreement to sell would provide for you, for example, to pay a deposit, and then the balance of the purchase price is in cash, as opposed to a mortgage bond. And the conveyancing teams would guide you as to how to present guarantees. And there's two ways to do it. You can either pay the money into the conveyances trust account and they issue guarantees for you. Um, or what you can do is you can leave the money in your own bank and ask your bankers to issue a guarantee for you. Um, but the conveyances and the bankers work together to work out, to, you know, to issue those guarantees. It's, it's, it becomes a technical issue. But yeah, you, if cash, don't need a bond attorney, then you only, only need paying a, a transfer for the transfer costs, which are the conveyancing fees and the transfer duty. Okay, and another one, uh, and of course, another cost uh, that's involved with home ownership is, and that people potentially, uh, you know, aren't mindful of as we're buying, you know, properties is levies. Uh, and, and that's a levy amount that, of course, you typically tend to find when you are buying into a sectional title. Yeah, I mean, you know, when, when you say to, when you, when you tell me the word levies, I, I think of two scenarios. One, one is if you're going to buy into a, a sectional title scheme. You know, as a member of a sectional title scheme, you're a member of the body corporate and the body corporate uh, charges levies. Um, and then of course, the other kind of levies you got is you got a, a levy for a homeowners association. So if you buy freehold property um, within a class of development or within a homeowners association, then you're going to pay a homeowners association levies, um, which, which, are, which are slightly different to, 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 to um, uh, normal levies, but they, it's still a levy nonetheless. And my, my advice to, to people looking to buy property is, and, and this is my advice to estate agents as well, mm. is when you're going to buy the property, ask for a copy of the actual levy statement. Because what, what we find is that if there's verbal discussions around, um, you know, I say to you, well, you're the seller, I say, well, what is the levy in this complex? And you say to me, it's a thousand rand. Um, then I buy the property, I move and I get my first levy statement and I see, well, the levy is a thousand rand, but there's a garden levy for 200 rand, there's a DST levy for another 150, then there's a security levy for another 300 rand, and before you know it, I'm at 1,900 rand. Now, I budgeted for a thousand, now I'm paying a thousand hundred rand and I'm unhappy. So, you know, get a copy of the levy statement and see what the actual levy is, and that applies for sectional title and for, and for, um, you know, a, a cluster developments. In each case, ask for the levy and find out. So for example, you might buy into a, um, into a cluster development, and now you're going to pay the homeowners association a levy. But the, the homeowners association provides you with water in that levy. It's just a useful fact that you can understand and you can again, try and plan for your purchase. You know, once you've taken ownership of the property, what am I liable, what, 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 what are my costs gonna be? Mm -hmm. And of course, then the next uh, uh, item would be rates and taxes. And, you know, sometimes I struggle with this one because obviously different areas have different amounts. Uh, you know, different municipalities would usually charge you based on the size of the particular property. Who would we be getting this information from? Because sometimes even the state agents don't know. Well, I, I think that the, 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 the same principle applies with, with levies. Ask for a copy of the, uh, ask for an actual copy of, of the of, of rates and taxes account. Um, you know, for a state agent that's got some useful information, is the seller in arrears, is the seller not in arrears? But the most important information we get there is what are the actual rates and taxes payable on this property? And you know, uh, uh, over my years as a conveyancer, I've come across people who have um, sold, they've owned a farm for five, 10 years. And they tell me, no, there's no, there's no rates and taxes on farms. 
these rates and taxes on all properties. I also come across some people who buy, for example, a section of title, right? And what they do is they own the property for three, four years, but they never receive a rates and, ta a, a rates and taxes account. And then they, they, yeah. they never get cut off. They never get cut off because, you know, the, 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 the electricity and water is charged by, by the lady, by the body corporate. So you know, if, if you didn't pay your rates and taxes in a free old property, that eventually you, that cut you off, I suppose. But in, in, in sectional title, people, people have this, this way of thinking that things, well, I haven't received the rates and taxes account from my sectional title, you know, therefore I don't have to pay. And when, when they sell the property, they get the surprise that there is an account, it's in the ether somewhere, we find it, we give it to them and the big arrears, and then they must now pay. Um, so rates and taxes, it's a reality. Um, and it's one of those costs that you must factor in when you when you're buying a property. And again, you know, I'm all for, um, you know, I think all good estate agents are all for letting their buyers know what are the what are the costs of owning this property. And the way you do it is by looking at the actual rates and taxes account, and you can see what those rates and taxes are. And of course, the other thing that the rates and taxes account may tell you is, and it's not definitive, but what is your electricity and water consumption, which is also another cost to consider. Yeah, and today I'm actually uh, exposing myself quite a bit. That was another mistake that I made early on in my property journey, uh, where I bought into a sectional title, everything is going well. Maybe four or five months after having bought, I get an SMS from COJ saying that my account is in areas. And of course, I'm going crazy thinking, what are they talking about? I've been getting my levy statement from the board of corporate and I've been paying it diligently every month, but now I'm being told I'm in arrears only to find out that an account had in fact been created it's accumulating all this money every month. And luckily I was able to, firstly, luckily I'm glad I got the SMS. Cause imagine we'd have accumulated all these years, all these years, one day I'm thinking of selling and lo and behold, I owe many, many thousands of brands um, in rates and taxes. So that is definitely something that happens that f when I bought those first two properties, I wasn't aware of. And, 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 and I think I'm also just quite grateful that that SMS came in. I think it was only 2000 rands in areas. So it wasn't quite a big amount. So it was easy to just pay that off and then set up the account online and then be able to pay it off on a monthly basis. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you something that I've experienced about personally as well, which I think is a mistake sometimes people make, is that you own a property and you receive your monthly accounts from the city of Johannesburg each month. And, and what you need to do is look at your electricity and look at your water readings and, and look and determine are they estimate readings or the actual readings. Oh, yes. So, yeah. so for example, at the moment, the property where I live, I can see that I'm paying the actual amount due on water but I can also see that for the last couple of months, I'm, I'm paying based on estimate readings for my electricity. And the estimate that the, that, that the city of Johannesburg is, is, is estimating is lower than it actually is. So what I'm actually doing is I'm actually paying in additional funds into the, into the account every month because I know in, in, in six or seven months time, or it might be 10 months time, maybe 12 months time, maybe 18 months time, the guy from COJ is going to arrive outside my house. He's going to take a reading on a reading on that uh, on that meter, and I'm going to be in for a shock. In that I'm going to they're going to do the actual readings, and I'll have a massive bill to pay. Um, so it's it's worth actually studying your account every month and, and making a sensible determination. You know, if you're paying the right amount, I mean, the, the city councils aren't perfect. I'm afraid. Yeah. So I'd like us to just address some of the comments and questions coming in from our viewers at home. Uh, we've got one from Lena Davis who says, I've been a victim of levies that just balloon once I've taken ownership. So thanks for the advice. It's a pleasure, Lena. Seems like we're not the only ones, uh, or certainly I'm not the only one who's uh, gone through an experience like that. And then another one from Southdale Mutombe who asks, what fees are involved when your mortgage is paid up and you want to cancel the mortgage? Okay, yeah, that's a, that, that's a, I mean, let, 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 let me deal with the um, um, second question first. Um, if you, well, once you're, you, you understand that when, when we register a mortgage bond in the deeds office, okay, we, we, what happens is your title deed gets endorsed with the mortgage bond. And if you do a deeds office search, you're going to see the endorsement of the mortgage bond. So if you pay up the mortgage bond in totality, so you don't owe anything on that bond, 
the, 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 the registered mortgage bond will still be endorsed against the title deed, okay? And, and what people do is people have a choice. You can, you can either leave it like that, or you can, you can ask the bank to cancel the mortgage bond because now you don't owe them any more money. You know, some of the advantages of keeping the mortgage bond in place is um, it acts as, it providing you have an access facility, it acts as quite a nice um, way to in access instant money very cheaply, very effectively, over a 20 year period and normally at a pretty good interest rate. Um, and the second thing, of course, and of course, you just be careful there because, you know, I don't, you know, some people cancel the bond because they don't want to access the bond because it's now paid off. And that, that's, a, that, that's a personal decision. The other reason people keep mortgage bonds alive is because often the, the insurance is linked to the mortgage bond. Mm-hmm. And what they do is that they just keep it alive for that. But to the extent that you don't want to that bond or you want to cancel it, you know, what you can do is you can write, write or call your bank, ask them to, to cancel the bond. The bank will then instruct a bond cancellation attorney who's an attorney on their panel, and that attorney will cancel the bond in the deeds office. And what that involves is taking your mortgage bond, taking your title deed, getting a consent to cancel sign and actually lodging in the deeds office and canceling that endorsement in, in the deeds office. And for that, the, the, you know, if I recall correctly, the attorneys will charge about four to 4,200 Rand as a cancellation fee and that include the deeds office charges. So that, that's how that process works. Okay. And, and of course, then um, another question that, or another issue that could potentially be a cost um, of home ownership, and this is before you probably take full ownership of the property, is the occupational rent. Um, if you could just take us through occupational rent, what it is for viewers at home who may not be aware of it. Yeah, so occupational rent is if you enter into enter, enter an agreement to sale and you've now bought that property, okay? Um, you, 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 there's normally a clause that deals with what is the date of occupation of the property? So in many instances, instances it's going to be occupation on registration or transfer, but sometimes the party's uh, uh, um, circumstances are such that you, know, you, you have a definite date of occupation. So you may enter into agreements of sale now, occupation will be uh, in, 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 a, in a month's time or six weeks time, and that date is then prior to the date, prior to the date of registration. Now what this means is you're gonna move into the property before you are the registered owner, and you will then, you will then pay the occupational rent, which is in the contract. So the, the, the first thing to note is, in my view, when you sign the contract, you should stipulate what the occupational rent is. Don't wait to negotiate at a later stage. The second thing to note is, you know, there's often confusion, well, what amount of occupational rent should we insert? And people are tempted to say, well, um, my bond is going to be X, so I'll make the occupational rent that. Or the seller will say, well, my current cost of the property is this, so I'll make it that. I think those things are, those, those ideas are not correct. What we should do is we should make it a market-related rent. So we, we should ask our agent to advise us, what is the market-related rent for that property in that area? And that's the rent that we should insert because I think that's, the, that's the, the fair way to do it. And also remember that if your transfer is delayed for an extended period of time, um, if it's too high or too low, one of the parties will become prejudiced. So a fair market rental is, is, is I think, the, the fair way to go. I mean, I've seen in quite a lot of OT, in, in a lot of um, offer to purchases that um, a lot of the times they make it 1% of the purchase price. And I mean, I, I haven't seen many parties trying to uh, negotiate it. Sometimes they're okay with it. Um, and sometimes it depends on whose favor it typically works uh, towards. But that seems to be a, a figure a lot of people are relatively comfortable with. Yeah, I, I think that if, if you have regard to our current rental market, 1% is pretty, pretty high. Um, it, it, might, it might, I mean, take for example, a 1 million rand property. I mean, you, you might get a seven or eight or eight and a half thousand rand rent. So you're dealing with a 0. 0.8, 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8, maybe 0.9% if it's a great property. But if you, if you buy a property for um, six million rand, you know, generally speaking, a six million rand property is going to have an occupational rent of 40 to 45,000 rand, maybe 35,000 rand. Mm. So in, in those cases, you could be looking more to a 0. 0.5, 0. 0.6% of the, um, of, of, of the purchase price. So I think, um, you know, in my view, the, the, the 1% is not always going to be the right, the right way to go. Um, market related is probably better and also have regard to the actual property you're buying and the purchase price. 
And, and Amaris, before we, you know, we wrap up our conversation this evening, what are the other costs um, would you want our viewers at home to be aware of when it comes to home ownership? Well, I mean, let, let me just run through a few of them. And I, and I think, um, you know, one of the biggest costs that, that people don't think about is, is the mortgage cost. So when you take out a, a, a mortgage bond, right, the bank sends you a, a, a sheet, which, which, is, which is a quotation, which is sent to you in terms of the National Credit Act. And what they do is they actually tell you what is the capital, if you pay this bond off over a period of 20 years, what is the capital and what is the interest portion that you're going to pay over that period of time? And, and, that's, and that's, an, uh, that was, that, that's obligatory in terms of the National Credit Act. And I think it's worth looking at that because that's a cost of owning a property. And then, of course, incentivizes you to pay down as much as your bond as quickly as you can to avoid paying. Uh, <laughs> paying the document, um, Marissa, I must say, it's quite an intimidating document, especially uh, you know if you're a new home buyer, you're not particularly aware of it. It's so thick. There are so many terms, and I know towards the end they've they've got the the term we do a terminology breakdown. But I must say, I mean, it is quite intimidating. Um, and, and I hope that shows like this help our viewers understand that that's something that's coming. So you almost shouldn't be too overwhelmed when it does come. Yeah. Um, and perhaps in one of the episodes, we'll even go through what you would typically expect in, 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 in a grant like that. And some of the major things, perhaps doing an explainer. Um, because I know that so many people who've gone through that process for the first time often speak about how intimidating um, it is and how some of the terminology you know the words, but you don't really understand the full effect of what it is that you're reading. Yeah. You know, as simple as what I, I do is I remind my team all the time that buying and selling a property is actually quite stressful. Um, and and be, just because we understand the process doesn't mean the client does. So I, mean, I, I encourage my, 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 my team to be as patient and as clear as possible. And I encourage sellers and buyers, you know, speak to your originator, speak to your agent. Speak to, uh, speak to your conveyancer, pick up the phone, you know, make a call, ask them to explain this process. Because remember from my point of view as a conveyancer, the, the, the better I can explain the process to you, the more comfortable you're going to feel. And generally speaking, the easier that transaction is going to run. So I encourage people to ask questions and also the intelligence. I mean, you know, people are there to deliver a service to help. And I find people are quite willing to take time to explain to people once they've asked those questions. Yeah. So you are actually going through some of the other costs. So that, that first big one is, of course, the mortgage cost. Yeah. Um, you know, then, then of course, you, you know, you, you, you've got things like uh, maintenance of, a pro of your property. You know, there, there's always a certain amount of maintenance. And if you want to maintain the property to, to, to its standard, um, then there's going to be maintenance costs. So that, that's just maybe something to, 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 to consider. The other, the, other, the other cost you should consider is, depends where, where you're buying, is there, sometimes there are additional security costs. So you may be moving into a free old house or, or a cluster. You, you, you may want to upgrade your, your security. You also want to look at how much is the cost to have the on response, uh, the, those kind of costs. Um, uh, you know, there, there, there's also things like the, 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 the you know, improvements. Um, you know, over time, people want to make improvements. And, you know, whether you want to see that as a cost, I mean, you know, maintenance is a necessary expense that you that you need to spend in order to, to, to keep your property to the standard and value at, at which you, you need to. Um, but, you know, people also want to make improvements. So you may move into the house and you want to cool it down so you pay for air conditioning or you heat it up so you, you, you want to put in heaters. Um, you know, there's also little costs that people don't expect. For example, um, you know, you need to clean your property. So it's going to cost you X amount of cleaning costs every month in terms of detergents. You arrive at the property, is there internet facilities? Well, maybe you need to have incur some costs in, in, in terms of, of internet. You may also have some safety improvements. You may move into a property where there's a pool, you want to put up a security. So I think well, what you need to do is look at your property holistically, uh, look at the obvious costs, and then also say, right, let's, let's think about these additional costs. And you know, there are certain costs like the, the improvements, which over time, and as, as part of improving on your own investment, um, you, know, you, you, you could look at doing those at, at, uh, at, at your own pace. That's perfect. Marius, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, that is Marius van Rensburg, who is a partner at Schindler's, and we're unpacking some of the costs associated with home ownership.
it's not just the bond amount. There are other additional costs like we've spoken about um, this evening. Thank you very much for all your comments and questions at home. And of course, if you want to uh, read up on any more tips, whether it's for buying, selling or renting, you can always go to www.privateproperty.co.za. Until tomorrow evening, uh, hoping you're staying at home and staying at safe. Uh, good night.